You're listening to the Scotiabank Market Points podcast. I'm your host, Greg White. Market Points is part of the Knowledge Capital series, a collection of audio, video, and written commentary from Scotiabank Global Banking and Markets leaders designed to provide you with timely insights and analysis. In the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, Latin America was reeling from high case counts and economic implosion. But as 2020 came to a close, while Canada, the United States, and Europe were struggling, and still are, to contain a second wave, Latin America bounced back, with some economic activity even returning to pre-pandemic levels. Latin America is now poised for serious growth in the years to come. Our guest on this episode, Brett House, Vice President and Deputy Chief Economist at Scotiabank, puts Latin America under a microscope and sees promising results. Hi, Brett. Great to have you back on the podcast. Happy New Year. It's great to be on with you. So Canada and the U.S., we, we ended 2020 with, with COVID surging and, and now we're entering new restrictive measures. How did the pandemic end up playing out across Latin America in 2020? Well, obviously, the pandemic was the main story economically, politically and socially for every country in the world in 2020. And the second waves that we've seen in many countries were Inevitable. Uh, There hasn't been a pandemic where we haven't had a substantial resurgence after initial attempts to control its spread. And in fact, if we look at most past pandemics, uh, there are third waves lurking for us out there as well. In Latin America, uh, the pandemic hit hard and early in the process of its spread through the world. And Latin America stood out as a real hotspot uh, for contagion in quarter two uh, as numbers mounted very quickly in most of its major countries. Its curves remained steep, even as other countries were starting to flatten those curves. And it's ended up with some of the highest COVID-19 case numbers in the world. But uh, there are some bright spots in the COVID picture for Latin America. Even as second waves started beginning in the North, in North America and in Europe, uh, the Southern Hemisphere saw a retreat in many cases as the Southern Hemisphere winter took hold in the middle part of the year. And as we ended 2020, we actually saw per capita COVID case numbers in most of Latin America's major economies at much lower levels than we've seen recently in Canada, the US, and most of Europe's major countries. So while a second wave is now beginning to emerge in Latin America, it's coming from levels which on a per capita basis are already much lower than we're seeing in the major G7 economies. Certainly positive news for for LATAM. What about to the various countries and how they coped economically speaking? Well, again, Latin America was not spared from the economic impact of contagion control measures. And in quarter two of 2020, as those measures started to be put in place in March and then fully implemented for the full month of April, uh, you saw some unprecedented downturns, both in terms of the depth and the speed which which Uh, we saw those manifest in Latin America's major economies. And so to that extent, Latin America really wasn't very different from the rest of the emerging world or industrialized markets. Emerging markets as a whole also saw major outflows of capital as investors fled to what are perceived as more stable and safer markets, um, as they've done in the outbreak of any major global crisis. The outflows this time were even more substantial and significant than in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, But again, uh, looking at some of the brighter spots around the experience in Latin America this past year, um, as the initial lockdown started to be eased in May in most countries, uh, the rebound uh, that we've seen both in Latin America and elsewhere began to take hold almost immediately. And in some cases, we've seen aspects of economic activity, including industrial production, construction, uh, mining and natural resource sectors, where physical distancing is easier than, say, some service sectors to put into place. We've seen levels of activity get back to where they were 
pre-pandemic and in the year before in 2019. And that's been helped by three major policy responses that governments in Latin America put into place. First, on the public health side, you saw substantial controls in many countries, whether it was Peru, you know, with substantial curfews and lockdowns, uh, Chile with a very risk-adjusted approach on a regional basis, and measures put into place uh, from widespread testing uh, to other uh, to other public health care measures in most of Latin America, you did see a pretty comprehensive um, public health response. Secondly, on the international economic side, what was truly different from past episodes of global financial crisis was the decision by policymakers to let their exchange rates adjust and act as shock absorbers uh, by allowing depreciation in their exchange rate, by not spending down uh, FX reserves in a vain attempt to try to prevent that depreciation. Uh, Central, Central and South American policymakers in many cases, put themselves in a situation where their economies and their exports became more competitive. And that certainly brought forward the speed of the rebound from what we otherwise would have seen. The third major policy decision was domestic. And policymakers decided on this occasion that they had the space to support domestic economic activity, much as industrialized country policymakers were doing with an immediate move to much more accommodative monetary policy and large spending packages to bridge households and uh, businesses through the worst of the shutdowns. And so those three big sets of policy responses, which were put into place to varying degrees across Latin America's major countries, had a critical role to play in ensuring that that initial steep downturn in economic activity began to be mitigated almost immediately as we moved from Q2 into Q3. That's especially uh, impressive considering some of the uh, political situations that played out uh, as well. So Peru, for instance, um, is an interesting case. It it had to deal with the the political upheaval of an impeachment. Uh, So are there concerns about their economy going forward as they reestablish more stable political footing? There's no question that Peru had... uh, a very challenging year in 2020. Uh, We estimate that it probably had the largest economic downturn of any of Latin America's large economies with growth coming in with a contraction of about 11.5% in 2020. Still an estimate at this stage until we get final numbers, but it seems to be tracking close to uh, a very significant contraction. Um, At the same time, it was the country in Latin America hit hardest by the pandemic, and that has seen some of the toughest numbers at the peak of the Latin American hotspot in Q2 and early Q3. On the flip side, uh, Peru is set to have one of the strongest rebounds in the region and across all of emerging markets in 2021, as some of the pent-up economic activity that uh, was deferred or delayed in 2020 uh, gets uh, realized in 2021. And in many ways, that's a reflection of the fact that despite the political upheaval, there remains great faith in the strength of Peru's economic institutions. And you're seeing that play out in real activity now. We look at a variety of indicators to gauge how quickly uh, Peru's rebound is proceeding. And one of the nicest ones to illustrate that rebound is cement sales, where for several months we've been substantially above uh, levels from 2019 for the same month. And that's a great barometer of the fact that capital investment is proceeding again, real estate sales and renovations are moving forward uh, very quickly in Peru's major cities, uh, and uh, you're seeing capital flow back into the country. Uh, Public investment is also being boosted substantially with a view to bringing forward projects that have been deferred uh, by the pandemic, and investors are responding. Uh, We saw only a week after the appointment of a new finance minister that Peru was able to issue at a record scale of around $4 billion on international markets in November, and part 
of that record issuance included a tranche of bonds with a century maturity, a hundred year maturity. So that's a real sign that when investors not only search for yield compared with what they can get in industrialized markets, as they look across emerging markets, countries like Peru that have strong economic institutions whose political institutions have been challenged, uh, but weathered that storm, uh, are seeing substantial support uh, from international capital. Are you seeing the same kind of uh, investor faith in, in Chile? Um, they're in the midst of navigating uh, a rewriting of, of their constitution. Is there political risk there? Well, Chile is set to have uh, a recovery that's amongst the fastest of any of the economies in Latin America with about 6% growth anticipated in 2021. Um, at the same time, uh, it is going to be, broadly speaking, when we look across individual sectors and the economy as a whole, the country in Latin America that gets back to pre-pandemic levels of activity the fastest. Um, that said, 2021 is going to be an interesting year in Chile as we move into a constitutional process that will see a possible renewal and rewriting of the constitution. And that kicks off with elections to a uh, constituent constitutional assembly due on April 11th. Uh, that is going to create an enormous amount of noise uh, around uh, that political process. And you know, we expect that there will be concerns that are raised by that, but we also expect that the changes that could be brought forward by that process are going to be limited. Um, the assembly is likely going to have a composition that is pretty similar to the makeup of the existing Congress in Santiago, which combined with the requirement that any new articles that are proposed in the constitutional reform process have to get a two thirds majority to be approved. And so that's going to leave little room for extreme positions to prevail. We may see debate around things that are relatively sensitive, such as guarantees for social rights and health care and education, the role of the state in the provision of pensions, where Chile has been a model of private pension provision. Uh, the independence and the autonomy of the central bank may come up, uh, but we don't see any of these things being modified in substantial ways. Property rights, especially water rights, minority issues, and the broader system of government may uh, come up in the process of political debate around constitutional reform. But again, because uh, of the nature of the voting process ahead on that constituent assembly and the fact that a two-thirds majority is required to translate any of the discussion on these sensitive topics into real changes in the constitution, we don't see uh, substantial or difficult uh, shifts in Chile's political and economic institutions coming forward as a result of the constitutional reform. It's hard to think about political change and not be thinking about um, the United States. What's your take on Mexico? I mean, Mexico certainly has a, a more entrenched relationship versus its peers with the United States. What's your perspective there? You know, that entrenchment and that connection to the U.S. economy has been the best of times and the worst of times in some ways over the last four years. Uh, certainly, Mexico has been subjected to volatility in the American political debate and discussions in Washington uh, to an extent that is greater than has been the case for other countries in Latin America. Uh, but it also benefits substantially from that connection. Um, remittances from uh, Mexicans working in the United States have been at record levels for several months as the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and restrictions to reduce contagion, have hit the Mexican economy. Uh, Mexicans in the U.S. have responded substantially by sending significant uh, capital flows into uh, the cities and households and businesses. Um, we are also uh, really seeing the uh, impact of the close trade relationship Mexico has with the United States. The relatively quick rebound in the U.S., is playing out for Mexico, not just in terms of remittance flows, 
but also trade flows that are leading the recovery in Mexico's manufacturing sector, particularly in the auto sector. And those are a reflection of the ongoing free trade relationship that Mexico has with the United States uh, until recently under NAFTA, now under NAFTA 2.0, the revamped uh, United States, Mexico, Canada trade agreement, which in many respects, I would say, you know, north of 90% of that revised NAFTA agreement is unchanged from its original. And the original trade relationship between Canada, the US and Mexico is one of the most successful free trade agreements in the world that has allowed the entire North American continent to overperform uh, in terms of its economic well-being and its share of global trade. And Mexico will continue to benefit from that secured relationship uh, over the next few years. I think it's notable, too, that the arrival of a Biden administration will almost certainly reduce the noise around uh, Mexico-U.S. Uh, relations, and that will be a benefit to business and economic growth in the country more broadly. Okay, so we've touched on Peru, Chile, Mexico. Let's round out uh, the Pacific Alliance. What, what's your outlook for Colombia? Uh, you know, Colombia has done relatively well through the pandemic. It um, initially uh, was slower to impose lockdowns as the as the numbers that it was seeing were relatively well contained, uh, but it hasn't been immune to the pandemic, uh, nor has really any country in the world. Um, it has seen uh, a substantial contraction uh, this year, but is set for growth north of 5% as we go into 2021. Um, and it's also done this uh, through a risk-adjusted, focused regional process to controlling the pandemic, which has allowed parts of the country to open uh, under what it's calling its uh, new normal uh, approach to pandemic control in ways that have seen ec economic uh, recovery uh, readjust and get back on track. And now the challenge is to pull employment levels back up again and pursue fiscal reforms uh, that will allow the country's finances to be put on a more stable basis. We see those as going ahead this year uh, prior to the presidential elections in 2022, and we don't see that political process uh, derailing uh, that fiscal reform package coming forward uh, in the course of 2021. What else are you keeping your eye on across the region? Well, you, know, you can't think about Latin America without thinking about two other big economies and countries in the region, uh, Brazil and Argentina. And uh, Brazil, uh, as well, is expected to follow up one of the shallower downturns in 2020 with uh, a relatively solid performance in 2021. It's likely to be uh, the first country in Latin America to see its central bank lift interest rates uh, as inflation starts to move up. In some ways, that could be uh, a little bit of a concern, but I would say that it's actually a broader reflection of economic activity recovering and getting back on track. In Argentina, where we saw pretty successful lockdown measures in the early part of the pandemic, give way to a rise in numbers later this past year. The real focus is going to be on policy reforms to secure a new financing arrangement with the International Monetary Fund, which will be completely necessary to ensure the sustainability of the fiscal picture in Argentina and its uh, international balance sheet. So everything is going to be focused, I think, in the next few months on getting that IMF deal in place. A lot of investors will be looking at LATAM for opportunity. So, Brett, can you leave the listeners with the one thing that you would want investors to keep in mind when looking at uh, LATAM this year? Uh, well, I'm going to be a little liberal in my response and say that there are a lot of things that investors should keep in mind as they think about Latin America that go well beyond the strong rebound that we've anticipated for this year and the recovery in most major sectors where physical distancing is possible. There's some broader structural uh, 
issues that they should keep in mind as they think about the development and uh, performance in Latin America uh, over not just this year, but the next few years. First off, even though uh, most of the countries in Latin America have put into place substantial COVID-19 fiscal support measures uh, to back up and underpin economic activity at the household and business level, they remain fiscally sound. Um, looking at IMF projections for the next five years, uh, debt in the Pacific Alliance countries, for instance, public debt, is set to be about only 53% of GDP, uh, whereas it's on track to hit 106% in Canada and 137% in the US. So we've got some strong fiscal frameworks in place. We've got five-year growth forecasts that are set to be about one and a half times higher than the US is likely to see over the next five years. And we've got great demographics where the average age in the Pacific Alliance countries is about 32 years old versus 41 years old in Canada and 38 in the US. Rounding out that picture, we're seeing uh, increasing financialization of these economies that is bringing uh, access to banking and other financial services to low and middle income groups at a scale and a scope that is much greater than we've seen in the past. And that's going to drive uh, greater investment, greater productivity, and complement what is uh, rising digital penetration in these countries that should see uh, sustained potential growth rates that will remain higher than those in Canada and the US, not just for the next few years, uh, but likely the next decade ahead. That was Brett House, Vice President and Deputy Chief Economist at Scotiabank. You can now find Scotiabank's Market Points on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. And we want to hear from you. Please rate and review the show. Your feedback helps us improve the content we create for you. You'll find more thought-leading content on our website, gbm.scotiabank.com. And you can also follow us on Twitter at ScotiabankGBM, as well as our LinkedIn showcase page under Scotiabank Global Banking and Markets. Please refer to our legal disclosures on our website. I'm Greg White. Thanks for listening.